You sit behind your maple desks, smoking stogies with your guests. We plow the seas and battle winds. We're Lake Siemens Union men. And it's not for love or money, boys. If you ask, what is it then? It's a brotherhood of sailors bound. Lake Siemens Union men. Men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstance, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. You build the ships that carry ore, run the business shore to shore. You load us till the holds would bend. We're Lake Siemens Union men. You cut the deals with the factories. We load the ore and sail the seas. You push us till these ships are worn. We ask repairs, you give us scorn. It's not you who perish in the wind. It's Lake Siemens Union men. Lake Siemens Union men. A ship is being in jail with the chance of being drowned. Merchant Marines, redirected to Merchant Navy. A Merchant Navy or a Merchant Marine is the fleet of merchant vessels that are registered in a certain country. King George V bestowed the title of the Merchant Navy on the British merchant shipping fleets following their service in the First World War. Since then, a number of other nations have also adopted use of that title or the similar Merchant Marine. Canadian Merchant Navy. Canada, like several other Commonwealth nations, created its own Merchant Navy in a large-scale effort in World War II. Established in 1939, the Canadian Merchant Navy played a major role in the Battle of the Atlantic, bolstering the Allies' merchant fleet due to high losses in the British Merchant Navy. Canadian Seamen's Union. The page Canadian Seamen's Union does not exist. You can ask for it to be created, but consider checking the search results below to see whether the topic is already covered. Damn ye, you are a sneaking puppy. And so are all those who will submit to be governed by laws which rich men have made for their own security. Damn ye all together. Damn them for a pack of crafty rascals, and you who serve them for a parcel of hen-hearted numbskulls. I never thought of myself as a writer, and when I took on the task of writing the history of the Canadian Seamen's Union, I had no idea what I was getting into. In 1972, I was living in the downtown east side, studying at UBC and working as a casual longshoreman. The Seamen's Union and the Fishermen's Union halls were down the street. The pubs that were frequented by longshoremen, shipyard workers, seamen, and fishermen were all within walking distance. The Patricia Hotel was a favorite. Many seamen had been living at the Pat for more than 25 years. The rear entrance was just a few steps across the lane from my back door. Goods and services flowing across borders foster new ideas. I was sitting with a couple of waterfront workers. The crowd kept changing. A couple of guys had to turn to at midnight and left to get their gear. Others appeared. A young switchman took off and came back with a half dozen orders of fish and chips from the only seafood restaurant. We talked about the Socreds, the NDP, football, and hockey. Why are you going to UBC if you have no plans to be an academician? I, I get to do some studying. I have a Canada Council Fellowship. It wouldn't hurt to finish my master's degree. Quit school or do something about it. Straighten out your act. Quit the bullshit and write the CSU history. I knew almost nothing about the CSU. The CSU is in my heart. We've made mistakes, and anyone who says he hasn't made mistakes is a goddamn liar. We've made a few, but we are still the greatest thing that ever hit this goddamn continent. 
it's impossible to ever bring anything like that back again. It was just so great. You can't hit it again. Impossible. If you do, it ain't going to be in my lifetime. If it is in my time, I won't be able to recognize it anyhow because I'm going to forget how great it was. I'll be too goddamn old. We are still the greatest thing that ever hit this goddamn continent. I finally agreed to give it a look. Oh, the skipper was bad, but the mate was worse. Leave her, Johnny, leave her. He'd blow you down with a spike and a curse. And it's time for us to leave her. It was rotten meat and moldy bread. Leave her, Johnny, leave her. Oh, you'd eat it or you'd starve to death And it's time for us to leave her In the stokehold of a 10,000 tonner, there were three boilers and three furnaces in each boiler. The three main tools in the stokehold are a shovel, a slice bar, and a rake. Anyway, this guy came down and he was green as shit. He didn't know a shovel from a slice bar or a rake or what have you. A shovel, amongst ourselves, we never called it a shovel. We called it a banjo. The reason for that is, of course, that it is shaped like a banjo, but also that it sings. When you are steaming and you open up your fires, you would sort of slide your banjo across the steel plate to spread your coals properly. It would make a sort of a zing. It was very, very hot. This guy was pretty green, but he'd never sailed before. This kid was saying it was hot even before we started. From the St. Lawrence, in about three days, we were in the Caribbean. In front of those fires, it was 130 degrees or more, especially when the doors were open. If you had a good fire going, your fire was white hot. You'd open your doors. The slice bar has one end like a wedge. You'd wedge this underneath your clinkers to let the air get at your fires. While you are doing this, you have smoke and flames billowing out. If you'd been able to take a bird's eye view of the stokehold, you'd see a bunch of guys black with dust, except for maybe the streaks of sweat running down their backs. The gases are gagging your mouth. You usually chew a sweat rag. Usually, we just had jeans on. Some guys wore shirts. I never. Heavy boots. We had a canvas rag in our hands to hold the slice bar and to handle the hot furnace doors. When we went down to the stokehold, you couldn't go down like on ordinary steps. You don't go down one step at a time. We would slide down the handrails from one landing to the next very rapidly. If you went down trying to hold the railing, you'd burn your fucking hands. Your hands became hard, like leather. This new guy, he thought he was in Dante's fucking inferno or something. It wasn't that bad, but he broke down and cried. He literally got down on his knees and started crying. As big and as muscular as he was, he couldn't handle it at all. They put him in the galley. On merchant ships, as in the Navy, discipline on board was authoritarian and brutal. The seamen, often kidnapped by thugs and carried on board unconscious, worked for wages determined by the ship owners and the crown. The authority of the captain was absolute. To disobey the most trivial or absurd command meant punishment that could be called... Vlogging. Staking out in the sun. Abandonment in foreign ports with no means of ever returning home. We were the scum of the waterfront. <laughs> I think that comes from the ancient times. The way they used to crew the ships was you'd be shanghaied from the shore, merely knocked out and brought aboard. That's why even today you have the hardest time trying to make a steamship company come to terms because they never got out of the habit. We used to get them for nothing. A favorite trick was keel hauling. Keel haul, verb, historical, punish someone by dragging them through the water under the keel of a ship, either across the width or from bow to stern. Humorous, punish or reprimand severely. If any seaman should be guilty of willful disobedience to a lawful command, it should be liable to imprisonment for a period not exceeding one month. Damn ye, all those who will submit to be governed by laws which rich men have made for their own security. With the beginning of the Depression in 29, conditions deteriorated. 
By 1935, wages had sunk to two-thirds of the 1929 level. Work became more demanding, and unemployment among seamen increased as the ship owners cut crews. In 1936, a wheelman was making only $55 a month, a deckhand $40. The seamen were forced against a wall. The seamen were being bitten both balls by the bourgeoisie. Finally, they fought back. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a union then. The seamen's constant layoffs brought them into contact with the unemployed organizations. The young seamen learned the value of organization and the fundamentals of unionism. What a lot of us used to do was go aboard some of the passenger ships and eat. It wasn't hard to walk into the dock area. The trick was knowing how to get aboard the ships and where to go and look. When you got aboard a passenger ship, you've got to go down a couple of decks. Of course, if the master at arms catches you, he runs you off. So we used to have our little fun evading him. With what was left, the crew always fed us. When the crews were all finished eating, they would say, okay, there might be six or seven of us. We'd go in and clean up after in the mess room. As members of the unemployed organizations, they learn more than survival tricks. They learn the value of collective action in achieving a common goal. Created under the leadership of the Communist Party of Canada, the Workers' Unity League had been formed in 1929. It had an explicitly revolutionary program <laughs> Under the leadership of the Communist Party of Canada. What mattered to the seamen was the tangible help they received from the WUL when they needed it badly. We set up a soup kitchen right in the Workers' Unity League Hall. There were two women there. One was Lil Green and the other was Lily Himmelfarb, who were working with the Workers' Unity League, and they were of great assistance to us. We didn't know anything about collecting money or asking people for strike funds or anything like that. I was elected to speak on behalf of the seamen down at some of the meetings while I had never spoken at a meeting before. And when I got finished, I didn't know what I said, but they said it was all right. I told them about the conditions aboard the ship. The women passed cans around, and to our surprise, people were putting quarters and dollars into the strike fund, you know, in the cans. We went into these little Jewish stores all along Spadina Avenue and up and around College and Dundas. The Jewish stores? We went into these little Jewish stores, and when we told them what it was all about, you'd be surprised the amount of groceries we got. Nevertheless, the strike was lost. Under the leadership of the Communist Party. If you look at the history of England, you find major mutinies which occurred on the British fleet, but not in the army. So there is radicalization. In the Soviet Revolution, the seamen were a vanguard, so to speak, of the working class. It is not because they were more brilliant men. It's because of the conditions and because you had a lot of time to think on long voyages. There was no way someone was going to tell you, if you work hard, you are going to become a boss and have your own ship. There's that radicalization. Why am I putting so much emphasis on this? It is because of this. Had the Communist Party not been involved... The Communist Party. There would have been another radical grouping. The seamen of necessity would have sought out some effective organization ashore with which it could ally. Had it not been the CP, it would have been a radical socialist party or a radical anarchist party, but it would have been a radical group. In this case, it was the CP. Why? Because the CP had the initiative to be present when the struggle started. The seamen looked around and said, these guys are going out of their way to help us. They are on our side. They talk our language. They put us up in their homes. They lay out bread for us. Hell, we'll look into their ideas. And that's exactly what happened. The Ontario seamen held their first large meeting just before the 1936 shipping season opened on the Great Lakes in mid-April. They formed the Marine Workers Union of the Great Lakes, the MWU of the GL. The union set out to win improved working conditions, safer ships, and higher wages. Dewar Ferguson was elected president and general organizer. Almost simultaneously, Ferguson heard rumors of another union being established in Montreal called the National Seamen's Union, headed by a cook named Pat Sullivan. It was decided that the interests of the seamen would be best served by amalgamating the two unions. The National Seamen's Union officially became the Canadian Seamen's Union in September 1936. 
The CSU was ready to approach the ship owners, but this time their hats would be on the back of their heads, not in their hands. To this vile crew you may the pirate add, who puts to sea the merchants to invade and reaps the profit from another's trade. He skulks behind some rock or swiftly flies from creek to creek, rich vessels to surprise. We are still the greatest thing that ever hit this goddamn continent. The heart of the Union wasn't ashore, but on the ships where the seamen worked. Ships committees ensured that the Union remained in the hands of the members. The committees, the seeds of a workers' government afloat, gave the seamen the dignity that only self-rule can bestow. There was a carriage driver who was very good at killing flies by flicking them off his horse's neck with a swat of his whip. A passenger in the carriage expressed his admiration for the driver's accuracy, but the driver kept silent, killing flies one by one until his companion saw a hornet's nest in the distance. See if you can get the hornet's nest, the passenger suggested, but the driver firmly refused. Why not, the passenger asked. Because, my friend, the hornets are organized. (laughs) The ship owners were challenging the CSU to a life and death struggle. The companies were refusing to hire known CSU members and were making membership in a company union a condition of employment. If the ship owners succeeded in terminating their agreements with the union and forcing the seamen to join a phony one, the CSU was dead. They knew they would have to bring the companies down hard. Local meetings endorsed the strike call right down the line. There would only be one issue at stake, the democratic right of seamen to work through the organization of their choice. Canadian seamen have the right to join whichever organization they prefer. We have the right to sign contracts with whichever union is representative of the seamen. We are not to be dictated to by a body that right from the beginning is controlled by outside interests. The strike as a whole was solid. On ship after ship, seamen seized the initiative and consolidated the strike. In Fort Williams, the 18 crew members of the Patterson Steamship Limited's Manta Dock decided picketing was a good first step, but that even tougher measures were required. They locked themselves in the galley and refused to leave until the CSU's conditions were met. The crew was fed by the Union's women's auxiliary, and more than 100 pickets controlled the dock. Only one struck ship, The merchant vessel foot was still moving. The ship owners saw it as the only gleam of hope in a dark situation. Canadian seamen want nothing to do with a union controlled by Max Rosens, alias Pat Sullivan, who has come from New York. A couple of years ago, they were calling me that damn Irishman. Now I'm a New York Jew. And if the owners think their men won't have anything to do with the CSU, why are their ships tied up today? The merchant vessel foot was struck by the crew in Welland Canal. The seamen went ashore and set up a picket line, but the captain pleaded with the strikers to move the foot just as far as a nearby coal dock. The strikers reluctantly agreed to allow three crew members to return to the ship with the understanding that it would once again be tied up in the dock. But with the volunteers aboard, the captain ordered the ship to be taken out into the lake. He'd hoodwink the seamen. Unfortunately for the captain, The foot was so short of coal that she had to return to the dock. The crew struck immediately, and the captain was charged with kidnapping. That was the last vessel to move, and the CSU's strike was a complete success. Back in the days before the war, when old man depression held the floor, the sailor's life was forlorn. The steamship trust had the upper hand, all talk of unions was quickly banned till the CSU was born. Slowly but surely it grew in size, then to the owner's great surprise, there came, there came, there came, there came a reckoning day. 
strong enough to stand up for right defiant of all shipping might the union was underway it boosted the scale of all the men from the black hole gang to the forward end conditions were more humane one by one the lake ship's crews joined the gang and paid their dues the union eased the strain the union eased the strain Well, the new agreements were there to sign, but late in the year of 39, war's threshold had been crossed. And overnight, the seamen became the most needed in all the wartime game. Without them, the war was lost. There was an eerie calm over Europe during the winter of 1940. In Canada, the Mackenzie King government still harbored hopes of limiting its involvement in the European conflict, but made use of its wartime powers to step up its attacks on its enemies at home. In November 1939, the Communist Party's English and French language newspapers were banned. By early 1940, a wave of arrests had hit more than 60 Canadians, communists and non-communists alike, who were charged with violations of the War Measures Act. Dear Sir, it has been brought to my attention that you are once again endeavoring to mind everyone's business but your own. In other words, you are trying to stir up industrial trouble among the workers. If you want to help win the war and be of some service to the community, jump into your boat and go out to sea and catch fish, where your talents might display themselves to better advantage than in drawing down a salary from an outside organization trying to organize a group of workmen that you don't want to belong to and I doubt ever will belong to. And we have stood about all we intend to stand from troublemakers like you in this province. And I'm warning you now for your own interest that we will tolerate it no longer. This country has stood far too many of crazy agitation from men like you and it is not in the mood to stand any more of it. We all welcome proper labor unions and we are prepared to do anything we can to foster and develop them but not the type of union you have in mind. Your letter is practically a threat to the organization I represent as well as myself, and from the tone of it, you are endeavoring to intimidate me, which under existing law is an offense. The groups I represent are perfectly legal and are the recognized unions of this country, the Trade and Labor Congress and the American Federation of Labor. From your letter, I gather you question my talents. Perhaps I have not read as much of Shakespeare, Milton, Burns, or Kant's critique of pure reason as some other folks, but I still believe I can look after myself and those who have trusted me in a perfectly legal manner. And regarding the boat that I could jump into, I will agree to do this if you will agree to take a two-wheeled cart and go around the streets of Halifax and peddle the fish I send you. <laughs> One problem in writing history about people you care for and respect is how to maintain objectivity. It was just so great. You can't hit it again. Impossible. On the evening of June 18th, 1940, Pat Sullivan settled into a room at the St. Regis Hotel in Toronto. He'd been working hard, constantly moving among the union's various branches on the East Coast. His son, Bill, was shipping out, and his wife, Mickey, was still cooking on lake boats. He may have felt a little more tired and lonely than usual that night. It was his birthday, and the increasing gray streaks in his dark hair were the only outward sign that his 46 years were beginning to tell on him. No one was aware, at the time, that he'd suffered a series of mild heart attacks. In lieu of the traditional cake with friends, he was planning to finish off a bottle of brandy. His plans were rudely interrupted by a sharp rap at the door. It was not a friend dropping by to wish him all the best, but an RCMP officer asking Sullivan to join him for a trip downtown. Sullivan's request to make a phone call was denied, but he was told he would be back in his room within the hour. He had the feeling the brandy might age quite a bit in that time. So without offering the officer a smash, he downed the remaining spirits and left with the Mountie. As a member of the Communist Party of Canada, it would appear that he is disloyal to Canada. No charges were laid. 
No bail was set, and there was no trial. He was given prisoner of war clothing. Pat Sullivan was the first trade unionist interned under Section 21 of the Defense of Canada regulations, but he wouldn't be the last. That hour-long detention was to last from June 18, 1940 to March 20, 1942. If you vote to have the Canadian Seamen's Union or any other represent you, then you must see that the officers you elect to conduct the union are of the highest type and not of the class that our authorities find necessary to in turn. Caesar beat the Gauls. Was there not even a cook in his army? Philip of Spain wept as his fleet was sunk and destroyed. Were there no other tears? Frederick the Great triumphed in the Seven Years' War. Who triumphed with him? Each page of victory, at whose expense the victory ball? Every ten years a great man, who paid the piper? It took the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941 to reshape the Canadian political landscape sufficiently to open the way for the release of anti-fascist internees. As the German armies swept toward Leningrad and Moscow, and the Canadian people began to see the Soviet Union as an ally, the continued, imp the continued imprisonment of Communist Party members became an embarrassment. The CSU internees, including Sullivan, were finally released to a warm welcome from the seamen. Sullivan urged full support for the war effort. Can anyone say that he is a conscious trade unionist and still fail to be convinced that fascism must be smashed? Wherever fascism comes to power, it sets about immediately to wipe out the labor movement. Everything that makes life worth living would be drowned in blood, as it has been all over Europe, were the fascist murderers to win out in the present struggle. What should we as labor men do to ensure the defeat of fascism? Everything we can. I repeat, everything. A few months after his release, the Trades and Labor Congress held its convention in Winnipeg. Sullivan was elected to the post of second vice president. In 1943, the resignation of the incumbent TLC president moved Sullivan into the post of acting secretary treasurer. I could hardly believe what was happening to me. It seemed so fantastic. Less than one year after my release from internment, appointed to take over the job of second in command of the largest labor body in Canada. For the moment, the struggle to protect the seamen's gains in Canada was over. At sea, however, the seamen were at war, the vital fourth arm of Canada's armed forces. A blacked-out ship zigzags alone Through the heart of the danger zone The threat of submarines is known To every man on board from constant watch, nerves raw and tense, sleepless hours filled with suspense, striving to pierce the mist so dense before a hit is scored. The dread alarm of the sharply cried torpedo on the starboard side, a sudden change of course is tried. In vain to dodge a hit Too slow by far to miss its fate Unwieldy turning much too late Each one from cabin boy to mate Knows that this is it The strident clang of the warning bell for ghastly moments, a silence fell, then a smashing, crashing blast from hell as the tin fish hits its mark. An awful feeling of despair, the fumes of cordite fill the air. Some of the men who were standing there have died in the dark. Of the thousands of seamen who crewed the merchant armadas, it can conservatively be estimated that the average age was not over 25. 
Hundreds of the young men who put out to sea to fight against fascism were under 16. Scores shipped out at 14 and 15. All that was needed was parental permission. Buddies wrote letters giving the okay for the kid to ship out, signed the would-be seaman's parent's name, and mailed it to the proper authorities in an envelope bearing the correct hometown postmark. It was that simple, and the kid was no longer a kid. He was a member of Canada's Merchant Marine. Established in 1939, the Canadian Merchant Navy played a major role in the Battle of the Atlantic, bolstering the Allies' merchant fleet due to high losses in the British Merchant Navy. It was a nice clear day. The water was clear and the temperature was probably in the 80s. I was back aft. It was three in the afternoon and not much to do, so I went forward to midships to get a pack of cigarettes. At one minute after three, the gunner who was on the bridge was changing with the gunner on the stern. They met at midships. That was when the torpedo hit and blew the stern out. It was from a submarine, but we never saw a thing. I got the cigarettes and was coming out of the companionway when the torpedo hit. All I felt was a vibration. The ship shook. I went up on deck and then A.B. said, we've been hit, get your life jacket. If I hadn't gone for those cigarettes, I would have been gone. They always say smoking is bad for your health, but it saved my life. The ship went down so far and then stopped, but we were off her and away from her by then. The submarine came up and shelled the ship to sink it the rest of the way. Down she went, all the way, stern first. The submarine didn't bother with the lifeboats. It was a German U-boat. It stayed on top of the water and never bothered us. We had nine killed outright on the ship, and one guy died on the lifeboat the first night. You got one ounce of water a day, sometimes two, but that was all. We were in the boats for ten days and nine nights. In the daytime, you'd roast, and at night, you'd freeze to death. You'd be wet all the time, and you'd have to bail steady in rough water. Some of the guys in the lifeboat never said anything, and nobody ever got hysterical, but what they were thinking in their own minds, nobody knows. Eventually, thousands of Canadians served in the Merchant Navy aboard hundreds of Canadian merchant ships, notably the Park Ship, the Canadian equivalent of the American Liberty Ship. There was always a ship's library aboard, which was very educational, Upton Sinclair and things of that nature, and the Communist Manifesto, of course. There was quite a bit of reading done. There might also be weightlifting or boxing. Being in a ship is being in jail, with the chance of being drowned. On the odd one, we had swimming pools on deck. They were only three or four feet deep, but you could swim in them. We built them ourselves out of canvas and two-by-fours and four-by-fours. You would be amazed at the fun you could have in one of those things. We never played water polo, but it was cool when it was 100 degrees out. 1,437 Canadian seamen died during the war. They have maintained the lines of supply across the Atlantic and the Seven Seas and have to a large extent been instrumental in keeping the war from Canadian shores. They have endured the hardship of seafaring under wartime conditions and may have suffered from immersion in Arctic waters or in shark-infested seas and have endured exposure in lifeboats and rafts. They have endured the title of the fourth arm of the fighting services. Oh, their lives are the gift that they give No more watches for them to keep now No more sailing the salty deep From now on, just eternal sleep Oh, but what of those who still live? Perhaps a few short weeks ashore And then carry on as before There is no rest in this damn war 
for such a brave man is he who dares to live in this travail merchant seamen we must not fail though then men will die the ships must sail until all men they are free there was no way these backward ship owners were going to tolerate the CSU forever they were not going to change their fascist mentality to suit the politics of the day since McCarthyism was coming to the fore, there was no way they were going to allow a union that had supposed allegiance to the Communist Party to exist. We have a move afoot in Ottawa to get rid of certain elements in the CSU. Not on the waterfront. It was too important. So what we see is an internal attack. They said, we'll set up another outfit to replace the CSU. They were looking for a Trojan horse. A couple, a couple of, of years, years ago, ago they, they were, were calling, calling me, me the damn, damn Irishman. Irishman. While the communist hierarchy were busy summing up what had been achieved through the strike, I was also summing up, but along different lines. I was trying to figure out a way to get out of the life I was living, with safety, that is. St. Patrick and the Snake. Oh, gather round, you sailors, you workers from the deep, deep blue, and I will tell you of a sailor, a worker just like you. His name was Pat Sullivan, of whom you probably read, the man who tried to break your union but broke himself instead, the fugitive of the dirty bilge, the man who has no shame, who sold his fellow workers out and on their union laid the blame. I am leaving the CSU because it's become a, a front for the Communist Party in Canada. It is under the full control of the Communist Party, and I hope that the honest, decent men who compose the overwhelming majority of the labor movement will take action before it is too late. The Communist Party has many secret agents in different places, including the government. I fear an unavoidable accident to myself. I have no pity for someone like Sullivan. If I said so, I would be hypocritical. But I am grateful that his wife, Mickey, who passed away not long ago, is not here to witness the betrayal of Sullivan, who tried to destroy what she had helped to build. Sullivan's defection was conveniently timed to arouse fears of communist infiltration and treachery and to dovetail with a drive against communists in the Canadian labor movement. Since breaking with the Communist Party, I've been asked from time to time, when did you begin to have doubts about the communists? Well, this is like asking an individual who's just been told by his doctor that he's suffering from an advanced case of cancer, when did you first get it? I, mean, I, I made my break. I issued my statement to the public. Once again, I became a free Canadian, and I intend to remain free. For 11 years, I was in bondage. Today, I am free. One month later, a newspaper photographer snapped a shot of Sullivan relaxing with a book in an armchair. He was settling in, it appeared, on his 300-acre property on Lake Baskaton. Sullivan had purchased the land one month earlier, the date of his defection from the labor movement. It was common knowledge that Sullivan had been broke in the days before his betrayal. Following Sullivan's blast, a new crop of company unions sprang up, and the Seafarers International Union, the SIU, moved into the East Coast, hoping to cash in on the ship owner's gravy train. We have a move afoot in Ottawa to get rid of certain elements in the CSU. The SIU and all those company unions waited like vultures to pounce upon what they hoped would be the corpse of the CSU. Sullivan moved boldly back into the Montreal waterfront scene he had abandoned, and he returned with a bang. Joe Davis, a CSU member and CSU veteran, was settling down at his favorite table at the Coq d'Or when he spotted a familiar face. He looked again to be sure. I approached Sullivan and I said to him, why did you sell out the seamen? He answered me by reaching for his beer bottle and yelling to his partner. Give me the gun. 
Someone took the bottle away from him, but I managed to see Sullivan's partner reaching inside his coat pocket. He pulled out a gun. The melee quickly poured out into the street where Sullivan himself grabbed the revolver. Sullivan placed the gun in my stomach and pulled the trigger. I figured this was my finish. He pulled the trigger again and again. Somehow, I managed to get the gun off him. The CSU was in a struggle for its survival. The fight the CSU is in today is definitely the fight of every trade unionist in this country. If it is lost, then no union has an agreement worth much if the employer that you are working for has enough money and influence to break it with impunity, as these shipping companies have. We will not negotiate with a communistic group. It has been the policy of our companies that we will, deal, we will not deal with or employ men who, to our knowledge, are communists or belong to any group whose aim is to foment trouble or to disrupt and overthrow the government of the Dominion of Canada. We have no quarrel with the seamen and unionism, but we have with the executive of the union. These vessels, built out of taxpayer money, were sold to Canadian operators at an extremely low cost, under the condition that they would maintain them under the Canadian flag. Canadian firms do not want to sign further agreements with the CSU until that organization casts out the communists among its leaders and officials. April 6, 1949, Halifax. A CSU strike is six days old. It was quiet but cold. Scotty Monroe was pacing the bricks that night as he did most nights. He was a veteran of many union struggles, but nothing had prepared him for what happened next. A train of freight cars pulls in, and the first thing anyone knows is that out of those cars come a couple of hundred goons and about as many Canadian National Police. They just made a beeline for the ship. So with this goddamn force coming at you, what do you do? You back up. Hundreds of men burst into the freight shed. They all wore helmets and red armbands. I could see later the red armbands were worn so that when the fight started, they could tell which were their own men. They came along the pier at the double. They shoved us aside while the crew rushed aboard. The seamen phoned the CSU hall for help, but by the time reinforcements could reach the dock... The goons and scabs were aboard, while 200 CNR police stood guard. The goons brandished their weapons. Some seemed to be carrying sawed-off shotguns. Hey, Sammy! Sammy! You're on the wrong side of the fence now! Shotgun blasts illuminated the air. When I turned around, I saw the blasting. He's on the bow, but I don't see the gun because I'm trying to get on the way and turn the hoses on. Then, boom! Kabloom! Got Sammy in the guts. Another shot hits Scotty Cranston's son and puts his eye out. When the firing ceased, eight seamen were lying in puddles of their own blood. Some of the men that were standing there died out in the dark. And nothing will deter the Seafarers International Union from their avowed determination to return the Canadian Merchant Marine to the Canadian seamen and out of the clutches of the Kremlin. Inevitably, the 1949 strike became a global struggle. The CSU newsletter was forced to resort to point form to compress the global struggle into its columns. Seven seamen shot in Halifax. Gunboats used against strikers in Cuba. Seamen sit in for 54 days in British Guiana. Armed police seize seamen in Holland. Crew imprisoned for 20 days in Cuban concentration camp. RCMP club picketers with axe handles. Strike breakers armed with guns. Close to 600 seamen arrested in world's ports. Crews illegally fired in U.S. Ship owners violate the Shipping Act and the Labor Code. Government of Canada actively on side of ship owners. U.S. State Department calling the shots. Gross scab herding by American Federation of Labor. Surrender of officials of the Trades and Labor Congress of Canada. Red baiting by CCF leaders. Still, the strike continues. Almost every possible weapon of strike breaking has been hurled against the seamen. 
murder, mm -hmm. goons, police, jails, gunboats, lies, slanders, splits, suspensions, mm -hmm. all of this to try and smash the most amazing strike in world history. It was to be a fight to the finish. The Canadian Seamen's Union ceased to exist as a legal entity in 1951. During the war, Canada built 363 dry cargo vessels with taxpayers' dollars. 90 were sold to the United States for lend-lease to the United Kingdom. Two were sold directly to the United Kingdom and 13 were lost. The ship owners and the federal government worked together to get rid of the Canadian Seamen's Union and the Canadian fleet. In its place, a maritime nation was left with only domestic shipping under her flag and a waterfront under the domination of racketeers. Straighten out your act. Quit the bullshit and write the CSU history. <laughs> One problem in writing history about people you care for and respect is how to maintain objectivity. We have been left a legacy and a vision. It is our inheritance and it's up to us to use it as best we may. I have declared my bias. The, the CSU, CSU is, is in, in my, my heart. heart. We've made mistakes and anyone who says he hasn't made mistakes is a goddamn liar. We've made a few, but we are still the greatest thing that ever hit this goddamn continent. It's impossible to ever bring anything like that back again. It was just so great. You can't hit it again. Impossible. If you do, it ain't going to be in my lifetime. If it is in my time, I won't be able to recognize it anyhow, because I'm going to forget how great it was. I'll be too goddamn old. And it's not for love or money, boys, if you ask what is it then? It's a brotherhood of sailors bound. Lake Seamen's Union 